small NGO centers for investigative journalists that started to um, pop up around Eastern Europe, um, it was um, an agreement to publish in the same time or even to wait um, for the other reporters in the different country to publish where there was no uh, immediate danger that somebody would intervene to stop the story so that we could republish the story um, and say, you know, it was a collaborative work, but it was also already published in another country. It's already public. So you, you could not stop this uh, story. The uh, uh, pressure would be worthless. Um, and it would be bad publicity for the people trying it. So basically, that was the start. It mm. was a um, sort of, um, as I said, um, um, a move that we made out of the need, lack of uh, publication platforms, independent publication platforms. But back then, it was paper. Um, mm. We started <coughs> our website that still looks awful now, um, our Romanian website. Um, we started in 2002. <coughs> How did you finance it? Uh, well, we did uh, freelance work for Western Media, mm -hmm. and we put our own money into the platform and the sort of uh, small operation that required some sort of IT expertise, uh, server, uh, and uh, accountant. So mm -hmm. it was our, our own money. And it still is mostly. We diversified in a way from the freelancing model where we put the money we make uh, into this independent platform so that we keep an archive of our stories so that in the long run people will come to us because they will find stories that we did about a company or a person that they are interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, and we diversified in the last 10 years uh, by going toward uh, grants and foundations money or EU money, but this I think was a really big mistake that we are trying to fix now um, because with a very small team uh, all you end up doing is uh, trying to fundraise and write grant proposals mm -hmm. and also going towards what other people would like to see uh, investigated and not what you really feel you should do. Mm. Um, so the money, it's still a big issue, right? Uh, and it becomes a big issue in Western Europe and the US in the last years, as far as I can tell. But it was never, um, um, it was never um, sort of, we never had the luxury to work for a media that would support us to only focus on the investigative stories. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that was the start. And I think we focused in the first few years to break big stories in Romania. And then we kind of uh, had a cross-border approach in Eastern Europe. Uh, next step was to work for the big media um, in order to establish ourselves. Because uh, no matter uh, how big the stories are you publish at home, there is almost no impact. Mm -hmm. And there is also um, little credi credibility with existing um, uh, <coughs> publication platforms. So our idea was, well, if we publish in tandem with BBC or other big media around Europe, then we can build a portfolio and uh, trust. And we focused in the last two or three years on trying to find a sustainable model for us to do, to do this because as I said, the, the grant money and foundation money, it's not an option for us, not the way things look right now. Um, and Are you publishing though in print or on the internet only? No, or? we are publishing well, on our platforms and mm -hmm. then we usually have a partner um, either in Romania or abroad or both uh -huh. or in other countries in Eastern Europe as well. Depends on the, on the story. So for, for instance, there was a big story on a um, German karate teacher uh, living in Romania for 10 years and uh, offering uh, karate classes for kids in the villages in Romania. I did this story with Toronto Star in Canada. And it turned out this teacher living in Romania for 10 years, he was previously um, uh, in jail in Germany for uh, pedophilia and he was actually uh, secretly filming kids in Romania and selling that stuff through a Canadian website. Mm. That was a research for Toronto Star, but then we did the local versions for local media in Romania and for uh, national media in Romania and also for uh, Moldova. And we also had a version of it in English on the Black Sea, which is good because Toronto Star is behind a paywall. So now if you want to see the, the, the full story a year ago, uh, you only have our uh, Black Sea platform to read the whole thing uh, with yeah. the names and so on. So we publish always in, in partnerships and actually we <coughs> use we realize that our platforms are very small, so um, uh, and we can't have a sort of daily operation. Uh, so we use this partnership also to use um, the media, the established media, as an amplifier for for our stories, okay. an amplifier that we can't uh, really have. 
And so we focused in the last three years in um, sort of expanding uh, towards new platforms and experimenting with what works. So that's mm. why we created the Black Sea uh, project, the Black Sea publication platform. The, the idea is we won't ever have advertisement on it. it the idea was to have sort of in-depth research from the region and authors to build their portfolio there to be found and to be able to get freelance jobs um, uh, in the long run. Yeah. And then we started the Sponge Media Lab where we work with um, others, coders, even activists, uh, legal experts, because um, you gave the example of uh, WikiLeaks and offshore leaks and all this other stuff. We don't have the tech uh, capacity or we, don't, we, we can't afford to pay a data team. Um, so we work with coders based on, 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 on projects and we worked on experiments, hackathons, meetings, whatever. And when we have a problem like analyze, analyzing a huge batch of uh, data, we know where to turn to and uh, uh, start from there. Yeah. Good. Craig, yourself, because you've had connections <coughs> with Black Sea. Sure. Um, so my name is Craig Shaw. Um, I'm actually a journalist a fellow at the Center for Investigative Journalism, so Gavin is sort of my boss. Um, I, my background is sort of different, so um, while Stefan was kind of at the forefront of establishing cross-border journalism in Europe, I think, when I came out of university, this stuff was already really well known, and, and it was these people who were doing the most exciting stuff. Uh, I never particularly had an interest in, in UK politics or um, it was these guys and ICIJ who seemed to be doing the stuff that was most interesting to me. So, um, kind of my, I did a bunch of kind of small stuff with uh, uh, Duncan Campbell, who I worked with uh, for and with for a while, and then uh, I became involved in Offshore Leaks. And we published, I think, um, I don't know, 12 stories or something that came out of that, um, that were related to a number of countries. And really that's how, so, so most, at least half of my work is cross-border in some way. Um, I work a lot with European, because I guess when Stefan started, there weren't really that many uh, non-profit investigative journalism platforms in Europe or elsewhere. There were some in the US, I think, but... <coughs> so um, that's sort of how I met Stefan on Offshore Leaks, and then uh, things tend to sort of grow from there. Um, there are, of course, these big networks like ICIJ that kind of co-opt people to be officially members, but most of the cross-border work, I think, happens between smaller groups of people who... Can you say what ICIJ yeah, is? Yeah, can you tell us what it oh, is? Oh, sorry. Yeah. ICIJ is the International <coughs> Consortium of Investigative Journalists. It's a, kind of a sub-organization of the Center for Public Integrity in Washington, and it is a member organization uh, that... Uh, its remit was to pick the best journalists in each country and bring them together so that when you had a cross-border story, you could pick the best person in that country. Recently, that's kind of changed because they have these huge data projects that involve, you know, 100 journalists in, in 100 countries. And that's kind of the model I think that most people recognize. Like if, uh, you know, if you look at cross-border investigations, you kind of come up with things like that. Um, where was I? So... Um, <laughs> That's really how I got started, and then you you meet somebody that proves trustworthy, and and then your network kind of grows, so that uh, that person knows somebody else, and they vouch for you, and and you prove yourself. So, <clears throat> so over the last few years, I worked with a lot of nonprofits around Europe uh, because uh, you meet, you have mutual respect for journalists and whatever. So, uh, so I did offshore leaks, and then that really kind of started me working on cross border. Am I, can you hear me? No, mm -hmm. you can speak yeah, louder. I mm -hmm. think your mic Put it on the other yeah. one. Louder. Let's speak louder. Let's speak louder. Connect it to your nose, me. that's it. Pretend <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got a mic to speak louder. <laughs> yeah. So, is that better? Okay, well, I'll just shout. <coughs> so, after Offshore Leaks, I began to um, uh, generate, come up with story ideas, and often the things that I was most interested in involved people in Italy or people in Romania and naturally if you are from the UK then you work on things like corruption then the UK is an integral part of that because it's like the front door to all kind of financial fraud and corruption anyway <coughs> so uh, so I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of people coming to me asking to join projects so that I can help them out with financial understanding of financial money flows things like that 
So I worked on, uh, what did I do after that? I did a, main thing I did after that was there was a cross-border thing on deaths of so uh, workers in Sochi Olympics, which was with Stefan and Roman Anin in Russia. Um, because the main problem, like, one of the big problems as, as a British person, and I joke about it, but like, we don't speak any other languages usually. And you can't do a project just using Google Translate. You need local <laughs> knowledge and people who can read documents. So it's important to build up that network of people. And often, it isn't really cross-border. Like, uh, you call in a lot of favors, like back and forth. And I think that's how it operates, because nobody really has any money. But how did, how did you get into uh, Sachi? I mean, perhaps you could tell us about what <coughs> Sachi was about. We were looking for stories. There was, we were applying for grants, Journalism Fund grant, and we were looking for stories to do based on Russia, because there was a lot of material in Russia that wasn't used. Uh, and so we were pitching stories about corruption in Russia, and it became very complicated. And in the end, um, one of the associate, one of Stefan's associates at the Romanian Center, uh, mentioned that there were worker deaths um, in Sochi, so we got a small team together to apply for money, and we got grants, and we worked with a few. We worked with Stefan's organization and Roman uh, to kind of do this thing, which kind of took a while. I think it took like nine months or something um, to finish. Um, and then I did some more stuff. Uh, we've done some more stuff kind of since. Like I, I tap Stefan up for contacts or whatever. Um, so that came next and then had the kind of interest in Turkey. But again, I, got to, I have interest in stories in all these countries that languages I don't speak. So I have to find somebody else uh, to help me. And it's also very important, I think, that I, it's probably different for Stephen being a staff journalist or whatever. But <clears throat> um, when you get people to get involved in your project, you have to, you, you can't pay them any money usually. So if they do, they don't really get paid very well. So you need to uh, bring people in and have them stakeholders in your project and you have to learn to collaborate. You can't keep things back. You have to share everything and, um, and work on a kind of much more equitable basis. Um, and I think that's kind of how, that's the relationship I have with most people, mm. journalists mm. or whatever. Mm. Um, Oh, that's great. But we'll get, we'll get into this later, and people feel free to ask questions almost at any point, and we'll have a big Q&A at the end of it. Stephen. Okay, thank you very much, um, and thank you for all coming here. It's a great crowd, and uh, please interrupt me at any point if um, there's anything that you'd like to ask about. Um, I, I agree with you, Gavin, that, that in a way, that, I mean, they've become very popular now to imagine these great collab worldwide collaborations of journalists of, and, and the big media organizations have bought into them in a mm -hmm. big way right but this sort of idea of collaboration has almost started as an underground thing which is really about dealing with the various forms of suppression which means that people cannot report the stories they would like to report in their home territory uh, and it, uh, there's something about it is because you know journalists have always worked together to some degree. When there was Fleet Street, people used to club together uh, in bars in Fleet Street and work for drinking, out though, for <laughs> drinking, but also working out how to get stories published that their their mm. owners would not allow to be published. Mm. But there was something about the fact they all presented the story mm. that made it possible to publish. By and large, the media is full of lemmings, and they will always publish stories that, as long as they've appeared somewhere else. You mentioned the uh, CIA story. Well, it took me a long time to get people interested in publishing that story. And uh, CBS uh, show, um, 60 Minutes, one of the most famous investigative show, you know, uh, they wouldn't run this story about extraordinary rendition for a long time. They, they said to me, um, you know, are you sure these guys are innocent who are being tortured? And I said, well, um, I, that's really not the point. The torture is kind of like, cannibalism it's it's kind of wrong you know it doesn't really matter whether it's the innocent or not he said well I agree with you but I can't sell that to my higher executives and time and again we found that actually by working with other people and presenting the story across a big uh, uh, sort of landscape and, and it all sort of popping up in different media organizations at once you can get really important stories published and most of the greatest stories you know that we all now think oh of course I had to publish it were initially suppressed and and because they involve the change of, th of thought which is quite hard to, to, to develop at the, at the beginning. Um, 
the way I think about it is, is a rather sort of juvenile way, but I go back to uh, when I was at school, in school assemblies, and which were very boring, and we used to try to disrupt the uh, proceedings by starting up these uh, slow hand claps where the entire school would <laughs> embarrass the head teacher. But we, what we worked out was actually to start this slow hand clap, you only needed uh, two people, but they had to be at opposite ends of the room. <laughs> so my mate would go to the back of the room and I'd go here and if we started clapping together soon everybody would join in you know? because the point was it was the power of things coming from different directions mm -hmm. and I first um, sort of practiced that in, in, in anger uh, in a, again in a rather sort of covert way uh, when I was in Brussels I was a correspondent for the Sunday Times and there were 2,000 journalists there <coughs> but most of, them were, and most of them were actually being paid by the European Commission in various ways mm -hmm. uh, taking various sort of research projects or whatever so it was a kind of press that was that was rather bought I thought and certainly they were not covering because so many people believed in the European ideal mm. uh, they were not covering some of the basic amounts of corruption that were going on and these incredible stories we heard at that point including for example a, a French um, commissioner Edith Cresson who was hiring her hometown dentist to uh, uh, among other things to, um, to run a research program and what we did was, was we, we met um, every Thursday evening in a restaurant, I forget what variety of restaurant it was, but, and we plotted, you know, the, how we would get this story exposed and we worked together because what we realized then, we were all working for, you know, quite sort of, you know, impressive sounding media organizations, which in theory large budgets, but most of that budget was not devoted, it was devoted to entertainment, it wasn't devoted to very expensive, complicated investigations. Mm -hmm. And there was not the resources, even with organizations that do have foreign correspondents all over the place, they don't really have the capacity for those correspondents to uh, do much digging. There's so much just regular news to cover. Uh, they don't have this sort of multilingual lingual capacity. And there was just tremendous power in assembling a team of people who would actually tell the editors what the story was, rather than be... Mm -hmm. uh, be told what it was. And we found that, you know, if the story was, say, published to some bit of corruption, published in a British paper, British papers, even all, all eight or twelve or whatever they are, publish that story, they'd say, ah, oh, the Brits, just another, you know, Euro bunch of Eurosceptics, you know. But if it was published in Le Monde, Le Soir, uh, on ARD, uh, or, um, El Pais, all together, they would call a press conference, they'd react, mm -hmm. and they'd be forced to investigate, and, and new facts would emerge. And, you know, the result of that investigation and, and all the sort of ripple effects that came from that was that the entire European Commission resigned for the first time uh, in its history, and I think perhaps the last time as well. Uh, <laughs> and so I saw the power of that. And, and again, I was just one part of this team, but I saw the effect of that. Mm -hmm. And again, on the story of um, uh, rendition, the CIA rendition, again, as I mentioned, it was something of a story that in a way we, a lot of journalists knew was out there, but it was really the struggle was to get it published and to find a way to tell that story in a, in a compelling way. And that, that way it became, in the end, uh, around this uh, being able to track the CIA's uh, planes and their rendition flights all over Europe, which really took off. <coughs> but even now, I remember that, 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 that really there were, in the, in the end, thousands of journalists who wrote about the story, but very few actually dug up new facts and were prepared to sort of move it on. Could you describe how you found that information? Yeah, well, I mean, I did some work um, on my own but then what broke it, if you like, was a degree of, <coughs> was quite a lot of collaboration and most of it sort of unspoken. But I mean, it was informal. It was before the age of, uh, say, you know, consortiums or before I was part of any consortium anyway. Um, so there was a journalist in, in Pakistan, uh, Masood Anwar, I believe his name was, and he wrote a story and he identified the tail number, the, the plane number of a, um, of a plane that was that, 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 that picked up a, a prisoner in Karachi by the Americans and flew it home. And he just, he's one of these journalists who just put everything in the story. And mm -hmm. that was good because it, had, it gave us a concrete detail. Mm -hmm. And that was picked up by a Swedish journalist uh, who, uh, Frederick Lauren and his, his team, who was a, in Swedish television, <coughs> and they made a documentary about the case in Sweden about the expulsion of, of one a group of Egyptians back to Egypt by this team that had, uh, had arrived in this, in this plane. And I wrote, funny enough, and their documentary came out at the same time as I wrote a piece in the New Statesman magazine called uh, American Gulag. So at the time, it seemed quite over the top, but actually in hindsight, in hindsight. just about right. You know. um, mm. And the, the 
and by coincidence, we came out at the same time. And I'd done that based on just talking to sources, because that was at the time it was a story that a lot of people wanted to talk about, but nobody wanted to call what it was, mm -hmm. which was torture. Um, we we and we found out about each other's thing. I phoned them up and, and realized that uh, uh, the that they had something, which is a, a little piece of information, a tail number, and we picked up on that, and then. Another collaboration, which is still rather, you know, un incredibly unspoken, which is a, a, a collaboration of a source who rather cared about these things as well, who was able to tap into European air traffic control records. <coughs> and together, we were then able to map out the whole uh, picture of, and identify the CIA's fleet and work with a number of journalists. And the, the, the important thing was, you know, the story would get cold. And it would get cold not because there were new stories to tell or new facts to uncover, but because the media would get bored. And they say, well, we've done that story about torture, you know. Um, but, you know, the things only have traction. You only change things through journalism when everyone is absolutely bored to hell with you, you know. Think about Andrew Jennings, the uh, uh, gen friend of mine who, who's a journalist who wrote about FIFA, you know. And, that and people are absolutely bored to hell with his stories, you know. I mean, no, oh my goodness. Over 20 years. Over yeah. 20 years, you know. But he just kept going. Mm. And sometimes it, it's, it, there's the great power of international work is you can, you know, tap into the, you can roll from one country to another and, and essentially force the agenda to keep, to keep going. And I worked a lot with um, colleagues in Germany, uh, again, who, who, who then picked up on the fact that, ah, oh, the planes flew through Germany, they came to bases there. Uh, and they started picking up on the story, and we, we shared uh, these flight plans. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, and I worked with journalists. I worked for the New York Times, and I worked with uh, journalists in Italy because there was a kidnapping in Italy. And our work was then picked up by. I talk again about this sort of, you know, the, the interrelationship with sources because then the, the magistrates in uh, Italy then picked up on all this. And then uh, there was a big development because they, we noticed and we wrote about the, the planes having flown through this island of Mallorca in Spain. And then the local journalist then, uh, at a tiny local paper, said, uh, you know, this is a, an outrage. And they, they phoned the local police who raided the, um, on the spare week. I can't get that done here, but you know, uh, over there, you could, they raided the, uh, the local airline office of the sort of air operators, seized all these records. And all of a sudden, we had the names of all the uh, mm. uh, CIA uh, personnel who were actually on board these flights, who were then with German TV uh, uh, track them down to their to their homes in uh, North Carolina, but across all that, what were the lessons that you know you draw mm. from that? Mm. One was it was cross jurisdiction because there are just certain things that you cannot do in certain places that you can in others. We all have restrictions and, and different ways of operating, which can hold us back sometimes. So, for example, one of the things that the Swedes did, which was very very um, impressive in my view, was they hired this CIA plane. Um, they, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they ran back, they, ran, they picked up, they saw that it was owned by some um, sort of uh, fake company. And uh, they rang up and said, you know, we, we, we come exploiting the fact that intelligence agencies never quite say what they mean over the phone. They said, you know, we, we, we represent a certain agency in, Swiss, in Sweden. They didn't say that agency was Swedish television. It was, uh, <laughs> and uh, we would like to, you know, to use the same plane again for another uh, mission. <laughs> anyway, they recorded it that, and then it, they got a phone call back from Langley, you know, mm -hmm. saying, you know, you sure you know what you're doing? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, then it, <laughs> and then they got a phone from the Swedish uh, security service saying, um, you know, I think which division are you in? <laughs> <laughs> don't recognize your phone number. <laughs> anyway, but they proved the case. They had it all recorded, you know, in a way that at the time everybody was the hard thing then with these intelligence stories is to pin things down. But they were able to operate in their space to use sort of undercover methods that probably would not be allowed and certainly were disapproved of by, say, for example, the Washington Post, which, you know, would win various awards later. But they moved the story on. And I think that's one of the, the powers of... Uh, what we do. And I could say a lot more, but I'll stop for now. That's great. Thank you, Stephen. Karina. Thank you. Um, I'll, start, I'll, I'll go backwards rather than from the beginning to the end. Um, so I'm basically a data journalist uh, who specialized in transparency, data analysis. I've just re recently just joined Greenpeace UK. My colleagues are here in the room. Um, and I've served some time at CIJ learning all the methods that I know from, from them. And I've taken part in three large cross-border projects, um, the last of which is SwissLeaks, 
where I was in a, cert in a particular ideal type of scenario where you had a large team in various countries on the planet, all with specific tasks, working on a specific chunk with some control from a center that will tell you what to do, what exactly is expected from you, a very well-informed data editor that would work with you through the knots. What was the, what was the substance of the Swiss material? So we were looking at records, leaked records from HSBC in Switzerland. HSBC Switzerland. HSBC yeah. Switzerland, mm -hmm. which contains information, well, client account data. And my job was to take a hundred of them and connect various account clients to other accounts, try to figure out how much money they held in mm -hmm. reality, through which parties, um, how many assets, uh, what kind of transactions they were making. So there was a bit of a bit of that done by the data researcher, and I was the auditor, mm -hmm. otherwise known as the fact checker, having to reconstruct all that all that network and try to pick holes that the others might have left behind. Mm. So just looking at people like Michael Schumacher, for example, which is a VIP, or John Malkovich, but also at serious diamond blood diamond fraudsters from Africa, keeping their money there, um, also finding clans of or dynasties that held pharmaceutical companies and how much money they had through various relatives. Um, and it completely changed my perspective when I go into a pharmacy now. I just see, oh, oh, that's, uh, you know, I shouldn't buy that because. Um, so that was Swiss Leaks. Um, and going backwards from there, I was at some point working for Thomson Reuters, but the foundation side, the foundation does humanitarian driven news. And my cross-border projects that were mainly technical, um, I had to, to lead international surveys into a topic that had to do with women's rights. And they were mainly data-driven. We were create everything from the concept to the structure of the data, all the way to the analysis and cross-border reporting through all our correspondence across the globe based on the results that we got on our surveys. And the service had to be done according to the social sciences methods in order to be done ethically. Um, not many newspapers, I've, I don't see many newspapers doing that. Mm -hmm. So quite proud of being part of that team. Um, and just to go to the beginning, I'm sort of newish to this brand. I started my first cross-border investigation in 2011, published mm -hmm. 2012 with the Black Sea. And we were looking into the gold mining lobby and revolving doors. Um, we started from a whistleblown document. We were trying to prove it was real. And because in one jurisdiction where we wanted to send FOIAs to find out whether that was real or not, the system was opaque, it forced us to go internationally and become experts in freedom of information in five countries. I did that in partnership with an Irish journalist. In case there's people who don't know what a FOIA is. A freedom of information, mm -hmm. apologies. Um, so it forced us to learn transparency laws in five different jurisdictions and go one was EU, one was Romania, the other one was the US, Canada, and the UK. And learn transparency laws and try to get different bits of information that would show a machine behind a company trying to push the development of a gold mine in Transylvania, Romania, where they also were planning the building of the largest cyanide telling ponds in the EU. So um, we ended up luckily publishing with the Black Sea, which appreciated the project also because my then employer, who was a Romanian national, uh, very soon after we interviewed the CEO of the Romanian subsidiary, who screwed up really uh, during our interview, um, put on their website the logo of the mining company and I resigned very mm. quickly after that because I didn't want to have to do with any to, to, to do with a publisher. They wouldn't talk to me mm -hmm. about what's been going on at their end. Um, so there's a lot of elements involved in the gold mining story, but you know, there's three very different projects. I'm happy to talk about any of them, depending on what you're interested in. Yes. Yes. Could you hold on a second? We'll get a microphone to you. Oh, well done. Hi. Yeah. Go going back to the Swiss Lakes, could yes. you please explain how you collaborated with the other team of journalists from other countries? Yes. Was it only through the ICIJ, which means you didn't have any direct contact, so it was like 
working on independent stories or were you aware of the bigger picture? Right. So I was aware of the bigger picture at all points. So what happened is that uh, in December 2014, um, I left the Thomson Reuters Foundation. On that day, the ICIJ contacted me, said, we've got this project. We need a fact check, an auditor. Let's interview you for it. Um, and three, three days later, I was working on a whole bunch of data. What the ICIJ did was to set up a virtual newsroom. You would have some software which you, through which you could analyze the social networkings. They had a, a, a big, large database through which I could search based on name or ID number or some sort of code that the programmers had set aside. Um, I had data from 96, 97 that I worked with. So I would get a number of profiles, number of names, a list of names from Mark Abra or uh, Emilia Diaz. They were my um, superiors in that sense. And they would say, this is the first bunch. Go ahead and see what's, what's happening here. And I also get the results from a data researcher from a different country. We're all working around the clock. He was an international project. We're about 136, 140 journalists working on it. It was quite large. So the guys in Washington did, did something very clever. They set up this virtual newsroom where you had access to other people's work. Other people's work was, was also visualized. And we, uh, we went on chats a, a few times a week just to see what the problems were, what the questions were, what the results were. Every single thing, every single finding was linked back with, you know, this is where I found it, this is how I found the proof for it. Uh, this is where I found something was missing. Hey, this is a nice story. Maybe the press would like to do it when we share the results with The Guardian and who else wrote about the story in different parts of the world. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think they had encryption at the back end. With me, um, I used Tor <laughs> to research various dubious names online. <laughs> um, so I used Tor to protect myself. I was working from the luxury of my bedroom. Right? So That's yes, often exactly. the most secure place. Yes, it? there you go. So you don't really want a nasty Russian oligarch. Not that they're all nasty. Some of them are nice. But you don't really want one that's actually nasty to find out, oh, this person is searching my name online. So. Um, I used the door to hide my location, and everything else was pretty much okay. We, we used an encrypted way of mailing information uh, with a two-step key, um, and that was that. I didn't feel threatened at all, but I didn't tell my husband what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're open for questions. Anybody who's got a thought? Yes, in the back. Um, th thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I have to declare an interest in that uh, I am an HSBC shareholder. <laughs> I, have I have seen Cressonism. It hasn't gone away in Brussels or other places, and I've seen how it can destroy an organization. I will draw in relation to... Uh, the point about the UK as the front door uh, for a crop financial flows to uh, the BBC Radio 4 file on four of two weeks ago, and I know the producer was here recently. And in relation to Stefan, what worries me is why so many international law forces who should know about something don't, but. Um, Stefan does. That's why we need people like Stefan. Quick question. Do you all reckon that the problem that was raised in relation to the European Commission, and I suspect a few other organ many other organizations, of a bought press, do you think that problem is getting better through your own work and those of others, or is it getting worse? Um, I don't like to call them worse or better, but I do believe it is a very, very real problem. And more power to your elbow. Thanks. Mm. You up, Tom. Um, I think it's hard to say if it's getting better or worse. I mean, as you said, the, the problems continue in Brussels. 
and I think that the Can you speak up a bit? Sorry. <coughs> the problems continue in Brussels and that there's always a confusion between being Eurosceptic and investigating corruption. You know, for me it's completely diff you know, two mm. different things. Um, the but I think there is a, the wider problem is, is, is that there is this ungoverned space. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've, we've created global mo mobility and global communications but for, for various you know, good reasons. People don't want a world government and a world FBI. But that means that you know, it's kind of left to uh, informal networks and formal ones as well. But collaborations, be they collaborations of prosecutors, or collaborations of journalists, if you like, to skip those jumps. You know, when I was working as a Europe correspondent uh, and travelling around a lot, you know, to find that it was so much easier for us to sort of take a file from a pro one prosecutor, you know, and go over and to another country and ask questions there, than it was for the prosecutor in Belgium to legally transmit that to yeah. another jurisdiction. So there's great bureaucracy, uh, and uh, and governments are not are very afraid to admit their own weakness and powerlessness on a global stage. Mm. I mean, you know, the, the truth is that, that on many you know, issues, for example, regarding financial flows, um, national governments have very little power, but they, they're so embarrassed to admit it and, 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 and act on, the, on the, the consequences of that to create the mechanisms to trace the money. So, for example, it takes a matter of hours to, to, to move money between 12 different companies, which you've all created in one day, uh, and, and get it around. And it can take 12 months to catch up and follow that trail um, through all the jurisdictions, uh, either for journalists or even, even for prosecutors, all the powers they have, you know, unless there's some sort of high-profile case and everyone sort of rushes in. Mm -hmm. But it, the problem is this stuff is routine. And, and <coughs> we, we sort of try to sort of fill the gap. But it's only if all we're really doing, I think, you know, and, and I think that, you know, Stefan particularly, you know, and, and um, this is, you know, it's a Romanian theme, but quite rightly so, because there you've seen uh, this uh, tremendous work at dealing with uh, you know, orga organized crime networks which span Eastern Europe um, and where, you know, the governments, there's been a cr great openness created, but it's been openness for crime. And there hasn't been, the, you know, at a government level, anything to match that what, what the uh, what the journalists have done to to connect the dots. But you know, all the journalists can really do is just highlight these problems and and say, give examples. Because you take the HSBC leaks, for example, um, you know, you find some examples there where, where there's a bit of information. You know, it's, it was a leak. It's only a partial point. You know, of some. You know, it's only one bank amongst all these other Swiss banks, all these other banks that are hiding the money. And you can just find a little example and, and make a point from that. But if you want to start the other way around and say, well, you know, I know this guy who I think is doing wrong, and I've got all this evidence, and I want to look at his bank account to, 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 to follow the money, people quite rightly say, well, you're not actually a, a judge, and you don't have the right to go and inspect any bank account you want. So that means all we've got is little examples to mm. prove the point. And you, but you, Nothing replaces the need to actually create much greater transparency at, at, a, at a global level to, to actually stop some of this stuff. Mm. Stefan, go ahead. I'll only comment that you touch an important thing, uh, talking about European Union, European Commission, and so on. Um, what I'm seeing in Eastern Europe, at least, it's, it's uh, first, uh, I don't think many people understand how these networks actually work. Uh, first and how they get financed, right? And in Eastern Europe, you, as I said at the beginning, you only have so much uh, um, uh, financial resources. One is to work as a freelancer for Western media, but that means that most of the time you work in helping others find information. So it, you can't really pitch your stories uh, or your uh, one year or two years long investigations. Uh, so other people put money into that. So. At this moment, unfortunately, there is only uh, the solution of uh, grants, small grants, big grants, whatever. And most of them come from the various European Union bodies or European Commission uh, structures and schemes. And these people operate with, um, first of all, um, 
with a, a design that was um, invented in the US at the end of the 60s. Uh, the way they think projects, the way they monitor and evaluate the impact of the projects and so on. So they are very focused on quantitative measurements in terms of uh, the impact of their projects. That means they put millions into organizing conferences, trainings, meetings, and stuff like that, but they would never put money into like producing uh, free and independent um, uh, content or an infrastructure for people to produce this kind of content. So then there are a few others um, who are supporting investigative journalism. And I'm talking now about Eastern Europe only, because if you go somewhere else like uh, Middle East, Asia, or Africa, or South America, there, there are different people putting money there. But then you end up in, in, in working for uh, governments, basically, right? So either as a subcontractor or uh, you, you get grants through a transparent uh, procedure of applying uh, with a proposal, but then there is this huge bureaucratic machine, even if they are in their goodwill to endorse such projects, there is still this, this uh, incredible bureaucracy that doesn't actually value your work unless it fits their sort of uh, very old, uh, it's called the logical framework approach. Um, <coughs> and that, that, I think, it's a problem. But then, on the other hand, um, you know, uh, maybe it's for, for us to uh, find a different way to do this kind of stuff, so not be dependent or wait for, for grants or for freelancing for Western media. And I think we failed on that uh, quite big uh, because uh, we had only this opportunity and we took it. Uh, and that's, for Eastern Europe, I think that's, that's a big problem. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how far do you think that ethics are a problem or a barrier to investigative journalism? You've all touched on this to a certain extent. Um, for example, there are some news organizations which don't favor going undercover right. to do this sort of investigative journalism, but do you think uh, that is a problem? You know, have you ever but they would buy, that in some way? But they would buy footage if you took it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Like, you you, you name any organization, and I'm sure there is an example where they use this kind of footage if they didn't commission directly. Karina, so, sorry. for example, when I work at Thomson Reuters Foundation, there was a policy of not working undercover at the foundation. That's where I now work, by the way. There we go. <laughs> so, there was this policy of not working undercover. When I was working undercover for BBC, before we went undercover, uh, we had a we had a strict set of rules of policies, and we had to assess our our um, investigation against that. And if we hit a score um, below the threshold that would says, "Oh, don't go there," um, then you could go undercover. You could, there's an acceptable amount of, dece of deception that you can practice. Mm -hmm. I think that's the um, it's actually an official term. And if you go on BBC's website, you could actually see. Uh, their their standards as well. Ofcom as well has a standard for um, for ethics, and I welcome you to click on their website as well. Um, and we also practice it at GP UK. I haven't done any undercover work. <laughs> I'm the data analyst there, but um, we're going to do investigative journalism, and that, that it doesn't have to do investigative journalism ha doesn't have to do with undercover necessarily. It's part of it, but you can do deep digging in public records and connect the dots um, that nobody else does. It's still an investigative process. You don't have to become a detective, Sherlock Holmes. Yes, but in some, uh, yeah. most of the countries in Eastern Europe, you don't have the body of work that you have here. Like, there is no prosecutor going after the big guys. There is no police right. work. So you, have, you, you don't have any other option in some cases, but go undercover. Uh, you define the evidence. Yeah. yeah. But, but, there but, is but the threshold is really low because a particular organization I was aware that when the, I was giving a talk about investigative journalism that even setting up a fake LinkedIn account if you remember was a problem because yes. uh, if it doesn't you don't have to interact with anybody but just so that you remove your footprint from just basic checks that was a big ethical problem because you are represent I mean I didn't believe it uh, but you're representing yourself as somebody who you weren't I, uh, I disagree <coughs> and uh, that's like that minimum level, I mean, for that organization is really very low. Whereas you know that sometimes you do some, you skirt the line of ethics to get what you want often, but. but Speak for yourself. <laughs> 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 the, 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 there is a problem with uh, a 
accountability within a, any group activity like a, a, a collaboration. And, and there is there are sort of, if you like, things to really watch out for and, and protect when, if you do get involved in a collaboration. And, you know, you have to make sure that you're accountable for what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, if you get together a group of people, you know, obviously there are people within there who may be behave differently in which you may not approve of the way they, they operate. And you, so you have to make sure that, that within that, you, if you publish something based on some thing that somebody else has collected, that they've collected it in a fair way, and it can't become some sort of, um, uh, you know, crowd where you forget, you know, the other side of the story, you forget the, 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 the proper way of, of, of approaching a story and, and actually hearing, you know, doing good journalism and hearing the other side, other side of things, and it, that that can be a can be a real danger. You can become very sort of partisan and, and imagine that somehow it's kind of us versus them. We, the sort of journalists, versus you know these bad old people, ra rather than actually uh, there is a, there is also a value in diversity. Rather than all coming, coming together, you can have a crowd view. There's also a value in the independent voice that challenges. So you've always got to, I think, be, be, be wary of, of all just being uh, sucked into one point of view. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so actually, my, my question, I guess, leads on from that, which is you've all, you've all spoken very passionately about the benefits of, of cross-border. It'd be really interesting to know the kind of risks or potential pitfalls that there are, um, particularly how you kind of formalize the contractual kind of elements of working with different people. If you're not at liberty, if you're not an editor, you know, how do you uh, synchronize the fact that somebody else might publish in front of you, or if somebody's interpreting things differently than you are, you know, how much can you control the kind of body of work that everyone's coming up with at once? Well, with, you want to have a go at this? <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will not stop. <laughs> so, uh, mm. disclaimer, because I, I started a year ago uh, a PhD at Westminster on how cross-border networks actually work, and if they are really networks. and exactly following this sort of direction to see also, well, the bad side of uh, the networks. Um, and I f find that one problem is that this kind of networks uh, end up uh, being or small organizations bottlenecked somehow at the top. And you miss a lot of opportunities because you have a centralized structure. And you have a centralized structures, structure because you want to make uh, things work and you want to move on and uh, finish the project. And all these huge, huge projects, I was involved with Offshore Leaks for ICIJ and I was running the Eastern European Research Hub with 25 journalists. Um, there were possible many good stories there, um, but they were just not uh, international enough or they were not just interesting enough for the people at the top. So you had there a lot of maybe missed uh, opportunities. Yes, the journalists would publish in their own country, but as I, as I said before, that doesn't have impact. So if you have a, a bigger group publishing those issues would have been uh, much more helpful for the journalists. So I, I don't see any uh, existing network uh, dealing with cross-border investigative stories dealing with this issue. And then, then you, you start to have fights over who controls, the network basically <laughs> and then people who are not uh, um, well people who still are journalists and uh, critical about it they are sidelined um, uh, so you have a happy crowd of a hundred people maybe that don't question much uh, the whole uh, network direction and I think you can easily go towards what Stephen was describing because of that you, 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 you journalists often have you know Usually have enormous egos. Uh, they want to. No. <laughs> they want to be the guy that got the big scoop, right? So there's always a little tension there, you know, of people who want to uh, be the first. So it does involve an awful lot of trust, uh, mm. and you have to work out ground rules of how you do it. You know, back in Brussels, you know, the, we had a ground rule, which is, you know, you, people got their scoops. If you got a document, you know, you you publish the story yourself first, and then. But then you shared the background material, and, and the sources were shared as well, mm -hmm. uh, by the, with their consent. And that, so that was a basis for you know working, where people still got their, satisfied their editors by getting their sort of first story. Um, there, so there's a, there's a, there needs to be a high degree of trust, as a, as I said before. There needs to be a level of accountability. So you you don't just blame some other reporter in some other country when something goes wrong. You have to check 
mm -hmm. things yourself. You have to remember that you know the, the, the not to be become totally partisan. And lastly, I think these days as well, you also need technology for this. Uh, there's a lot of trust involved in sharing huge amounts of material, and you know with a great deal of surveillance uh, going on and interception, and some of these projects being quite sensitive, uh, you actually need to put in place and work with people who can secure the material and provide means of you know encryption and whatever, so that people can you know, safely and also with confidence share, share material. But I wanted to ask Stefan about his research that if when you have these centralized structures, is there a tendency to kind of put uh, as kind of second class certain regions or countries <coughs> so that obviously Western, that kind of Europe is given more prominence and that so they f then forget that they're actually the impact in smaller countries because I mean that was the main issue with WikiLeaks that it had such a big impact in these developing countries um, but is there a tendency to in your research to uh, ignore? That's a rhetorical question. No, no. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, of course. I mean I find these uh, uh, cross-border networks to be a very elitistic thing. Um, it's a trend, it's a hype, uh, but uh, think about uh, how many of these cross-border, uh, big cross-border collaborations are published every year and in, in what countries they have uh, the impact. And coming back to what you were describing about the WikiLeaks uh, uh, documents mm. that are not in English, mm. uh, how many of these big cross-border networks start uh, working on a batch of uh, documents in Russian or Chinese or Arabic? Exactly, exactly. I would just say, too, that uh, in answer to that question, that the WikiLeaks is a very good example of one problem with it. Because if The Guardian, for example, tried to negotiate a complicated exclusivity deal with WikiLeaks, they then found that, that they had never told the progenitor of these documents, Julian Assange, that they had made such arrangements. So the arrangement that WikiLeaks had made with The Guardian was that The Guardian would publish together with El Pais, with Le Monde, Le Der Spiegel, with The Washington Post, with The New York Times. All those were nominal agreements that were being made. But however, they decided, however, with the exclusivity issue, that that was much more important than any ethical problem about sharing this material with other newspapers. So The Guardian, in all its great wisdom and profundity and liberalness, decided simply to publish it all themselves, which they did, and to claim credit for it. That's why there's not a single person associated with WikiLeaks who works now for The Guardian. Uh, they've all moved to Brazil and other places, lest they be smeared with the same brush. But the complications of that were enormous. It meant that people didn't trust each other anymore. It meant that distrust, that fundamental trust had been violated, particularly in the case of, of, of one author in The Guardian who wrote a book about WikiLeaks in which one of the chapter headings contained the entire coding system to protect that material from the secret police. But because of the vindictive nature of this curious transactions that developed, that they were able to publish without any difficulty a code which enabled every gangster, secret police, tyrant, any lunatic to get all this material to use it against other people. And that's a real problem with this kind of trust when it doesn't exist really. And um, I mean, Stephen was very accurate at one meeting a, a few years ago about precisely this problem. And I think that uh, it's something we, we ignore at our peril. You have to work with people when you're dealing with sensitive material with great trust. Uh, as our Mexican friends have discovered. But so data, data does very strange things to people, to journalists. Mm -hmm. And the few projects I've worked on with big data, it's like a soap opera often. <laughs> uh, there's an issue of propriety and, and it causes a lot of complication. I think people are learning to do it better, definitely. But it works better in smaller groups. Can you give an example? Uh, no, well, I mean, the, every, you know, there are always, there's a, there's, like Stefan said, there's an idea of like, when you push the idea of a collaborative project, so, you know, 20 journalists, 10 journalists, 30 journalists, 150 journalists, it's essentially also a PR exercise, because nobody says actually this, at some points was crazy. Like it's now a bunch of people don't talk to each other and, and that kind of stuff happens. But unless you talk about it, you, it's difficult to, for people to, to learn like actually what happens because you're dealing with people who are 
particularly who have had 10, 20, 30 years of journalism who are kind of work on their own, and they're used to having that, it, it, I think it can, um, it can create problems. And there are problems, but it's, it's not something that's really admitted to in public. Um, but I, I don't want to... I mean, I think, Gavin, you raise a number of important issues, but I would just say that they're not here to represent their... You talked about various things that happened to The Guardian, and, and they're not here to des describe their side of the story, so I don't feel that yeah. comfortable mm. going into a, that whole saga. I would just say that was a, you know, there, there is an element, this is all, you know, this is, there is some real new element to all this, is, 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 is handling these huge dumps of material. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, it's just, it's, it is really un unprecedented, and, and there is definitely a kind of learning process going on, not just about, not everyone has learned, but uh, there is learning going on, um, of, of how to deal with the sources who bring this material, mm -hmm. and also how to, uh, you know, deal with the fact that you know the material is not just about one country. Its its value is in all the places that it, mm. uh, where it, it comes out. But it, I mean, there, there's been all kinds of squabbling over this material because it's all been it's dominated the headlines, you know, and people have no, wanted that, all wanted a piece of it, and you know, been left out of it or been you know, not got the credit they deserve, and all that sort of thing. You know. But I, I agree with Craig on, on the point that if you work in smaller teams, it's much better, especially when you work with data, because even if the people at the center are good-willed, say you have to pass through several filters as a freelancer, and I have a lot of that experience, then if you pitch a story that you find, you may just discover a month later that they've done it without you, You've been, if you haven't been credited or involved at all in that story. And again, working with friends that I've worked with everyone on, on my right, it's, and I would work with Stephen at any time. It's, it's you know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there we go. So working with friends really helps, or if you're just starting, starting in a new team, just going in with an open heart and forcing everyone to become friends in a way, that really, really helps. Otherwise, as a freelancer, you get pushed aside, and although you get, you, your story is there, and they get credit for it, you'll never see it with your name on it, and which is depressing. Okay. Go ahead. You ahead. Microphone. Yeah. Oh, all right, go ahead. Um, thanks so much for uh, speaking tonight. It's been fascinating listening to each one of you. Um, I was wondering, um, today the Home Secretary, Theresa May, uh, announced uh, some counterterrorism measures. Um, and so I, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that, uh, specifically in relation to uh, online censorship, um, and if you could foresee any problems for um, international journalism or even domestic journalism because of these measures. Yeah, you want to talk about it? I mean, I think the, the, uh, the context of the question is interesting because there has never been a, a period in my ex long time in journalism in 40 years where I've seen anything like the surveillance, the censorship, the omission um, uh, in, in the editorial process that now is completely commonplace. So it's, it's uh, the idea that, that there's a new steps being taken to prevent journalists from doing what they're supposed to do is, is almost bizarre because they've been doing it now for several years and nobody thinks anything of it. I mean, the, what's, omission, what's omitted from stories is much more important than what's censored. And that, that's the reality, I think. But it's, I think it's self, I mean, <clears throat> nobody in the UK can really uh, lay claim to the fact that they are in danger from stories. Okay, there's a libel issue, definitely. But in terms of other countries, um, I have an interest in Turkey, where they're locking, they have locked journalists up, and they do frequently use, ter they label them as terrorists. If you write uh, balanced stories about the PKK, or, and they're doing it quite aggressively now. So I don't think, I don't, I don't, the answer is I don't know, but you, we don't live in a world where that's a genuine risk. We have one risk, which is, apathy of editors or lack of balls or we have libel and that's it you you don't we don't come from a world where that's where we face real proper realities that other journalists do every day and still do the work i mean i just to go on further slightly further that uh, we have colleagues who are now in berlin who can't return to britain and they're journalists they can't return here because of the threat apparently from the metropolitan police of being charged with conspiracy. And when, you, when our lawyers ask, what is the conspiracy? 
They're graded with, we can't tell you. I mean, that's like sort of Paraguay in 1948. You know, it, it's an, a, a bizarre notion that journalists who are transmitting information, who have nothing to do with even how the information was secured, are being held up and being prevented from coming into the country. You can travel to the States easier than you can to Britain, as, as uh, Glenn Greenwald's partner discovered. But, but it's, it's actually quite a serious problem, and it'll get worse and worse, particularly for the reasons you, you suggested. In the back? Oh, sorry, you were down here. Go ahead. Yes, um, Patrick Cahoon. I'm first time here. And I think I'm right in thinking that one of the main aims of the Frontline Club is to deal with corruption. Am I right? Mm. And corruption is a huge issue all over the world. And I'm particularly interested in the Romanian angle because I've been there 76 times now. <laughs> and um, thank you. Yeah, I counted. <laughs> <laughs> and um, indeed, corruption is an issue. And George Soros' Open Society Foundation um, institution, or whatever it's called, they did a survey of corruption in the EU candidate countries in 2002. And it said that in all those countries, with one exception, Slovenia for some reason, Corruption in healthcare, while not necessarily the biggest corruption, affected more people than any other single form of corruption. Mm. Therefore, I think we all need, including you lot, a strategy for how to deal with corruption. Because you've got to get it walking on two feet. Mm -hmm. It's not just an idea. And I would like to see Romania be the former communist country that leads the way out of corruption. And it could happen in healthcare, where, where there should be the least corruption of all, because it's supposed to be a caring profession. And um, an advisor to a former prime minister of Hungary told me how it started. In the early 50s, the Stalinist leadership of all these countries knew they needed doctors, decided to pay them like road sweepers, and encourage the population to give them bribes, which had the wonderful effect of putting all these intellectuals on the wrong side of the law, so they could put political pressure on all of them. And this mm -hmm. man who told me was one of the student leaders in 56 mm -hmm. and was advisor to former prime minister. But I would like to see you get a strategy somewhere <coughs> for dealing with corruption in a particular area that can be contagious, a vision for these countries and for the people involved. Mm -hmm. And there's a fantastic Indian company in healthcare called TransAsia Biomedical that just absolutely won't pay a single rupee anywhere in bribes. And it was written up in the Transparency International's 2006 Global Corruption Report, which had its centerpiece as a healthcare. And there are opportunities, but I think you need to get a strategy, because you're all talking about different things in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so do get a strategy, and I'd like to work with any of you who want to do this, because I think we could have a major explosion in Romania that could set the pace for change in Eastern Europe. Your, your, your comment you tricked the memory. Uh, when I started the project on gold mining lobby, I foyered, I sent requests for all the correspondence between the mining company and the Romanian presidency, yeah. um, containing a certain word. And they said they cannot keyword search a database. <laughs> Do you think things are changing under the new president? Um, I have to FOIA again. And I'll, I'll let you know, but let's just do that, and let's just take, all, take it all the way to a lawsuit if they give us the same answer. Okay. Okay. We have okay. Oh, somebody back here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, you've all like, shared a really interesting experience and perspective. I actually have a question for Craig, who's um, had experience in Russia, and I can only imagine how hostile um, to be working in Russia, considering that the, um, they have this uh, atmosphere of suspicion and paranoia to its, the West. So. Um, I'm intrigued by how do you overcome, if you have um, that language barrier, how do you overcome that, especially since, how do you ascertain that the information that you're getting is um, truthful or correct and you're not being fed by, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm hoping I'm framing this correctly, and how do you um, manage to earn the trust to report the news uh, truthfully, I mean, well, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Stephen might be slightly better. Uh, we had a journalist there, Roman Annin, who works with Stephen as well. Uh, and I trusted Roman. Um, uh, I didn't go to Russia. That's, I mean, that's kind of part of the cross-border experience as well. Is it, it's kind of cheaper in the sense that you already have somebody in that country. 
so you don't necessarily need to to go there and take a fixer and <coughs> talk louder or whatever to communicate. Um, I, I mean, it's uh, anyway. You, you uh, the data the information that you get, you have to verify. Uh, we had, I mean, it's the one story was the dead migrant workers. Uh, it was very difficult to get information, but we had like a like a dozen sources, I think, for that story. Um, and it was still we didn't we didn't get it all. I couldn't nail down an exact number. I just knew that we just had kind of rough estimates from different different countries. Um, I didn't believe the number that the Russian state gave us because it was way too low. It was less than the number of people who had died in Moldova, for example. So, uh, but the whole point is that you're finding information that is counter to the, the narrative of the state anyway, <coughs> or, or companies in a, in a But I don't know, maybe Ro yeah. Stephen does, has done a lot of Russian stuff, so maybe he can. Well, just with your general point, which I think applies in other places as well, is uh, you were saying about often ending up working for Western media organizations. Well, the, the, but the, the model has changed and, what, and c collaboration is part of that in that, you know, when I started up, you know, working on Fleet Street, you'd work with foreign journalists and they would be called fixers, even though they were actually journalists, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't get a single credit. You know, of course they'd be paid, but the, and, there was, and there weren't organizations like Frontline defending their interests. Uh, the Frontline Club and, and their charity, you know, when they were killed, uh, there, was, there wasn't that level of, um, of, of equality. Now, that quality hasn't, it's not that everything's equal now, and there's still that sort of inequality of the way journalists in other countries are treated, but part of the model that's emerged is a much more collaborative and much, gives much more recognition to the local journalists, and there's a lot of trust there. And they are also, it's part of the accountability as well. So that most media organizations now are giving, you know, they put in the names of the journalists, not always on the top, who are working with them in these countries. They used to call them fixers. Now they are fellow journalists in other places. And, but that's also sharing the accountability. So because those names are there. And mutually, by having your name there, it's part of also the reliability process because they're standing up, putting their name to something and saying, it's 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 accurate. So you're relying on a lot of local knowledge and tapping into that, and local courage as well to get your story out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, hello. I have two issues that um, I would like maybe you to comment on. The first one is to do with corruption and corruption. There is big corruption and small corruption. Like if you go and bribe your GP just to be seen earlier, or you know you'll be maybe less damage than you pay in America or going here to a dentist where you pay lots of money and you still have to wait and things like that. So just to go and film somebody because they pay like a little two pounds or something just to be seen earlier, that is maybe a form of corruption but it's completely different from macro big corruption that has, my, I don't know, tax dodging in, in the UK or fi financial finangling and things like that. So. If you can comment, you know, on like dangerous corruption and just <coughs> maybe, you know, little things that gets often published. And the second issue is to do with um, the editors, like you said, the censorship and 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 on meeting of, of a lot of facts. And um, I would like to know how is is taking place that the editors continue to publish a lot of falsifications, a lot of uh, you know tampering with the truth, and they seem to be getting away with that. Just you know. You know that the, the stories that we are reading every day are not true, and they are falsified, fabricated, and recreated, and with all, all sorts of fixers and you know fractures of stories. They get away with that, but we never get to know the truth. The, you know what is corruption, what is reality, what's what's going on. So maybe you can start commenting a bit on. <laughs> It's quite philosophical, but yeah. You could no, it's a, it's a whole other meeting. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid. <clears throat> it's a massive subject, and you couldn't be more right. The difficulty is when people talk about it, the general assumption is if they, if they deny it's true, it, it's true. 
Uh, if they say it's not uh, the case, you know it probably is. So and we all operate on that supposition. As they used to say in the muckrakers tradition in the States, that uh, any government lies, it's a question is only what the degree is. Uh, <clears throat> so we operate from that supposition. One other hand, I think, yeah. over here. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, there was a point made earlier about the difficulty of tracing information. Uh, Stephen's example about, you know, four hours, 12 uh, bank transfers across borders, and then it takes a year to trace it. And I thought that the implication there was that it would be easier and great if that were made uh, easier, for example, for members of the press. Wouldn't that be a double-edged sword in the sense that at the same time you could have people who are not bona fide members of the press, but they have a press pass, because that's not very difficult to get, isn't it? And then they would use such, let's call them enhanced powers, to find out stuff that actually deserves privacy. So in a way you would be demolishing indirectly and as an, un as an unintended consequence, precisely the sort of thing that many people militate against, which is, you know, uh, data protection and, and sort of uh, confidentiality. I don't think the corporations uh, have a, should be private. Um, there's, they, they have the status of, they call them legal, <coughs> legal persons, and they have all these sort of protection, mm. and, they, and they also have liability, which they can borrow lots of money and never pay it back. Um, the, of course, there's a trade-off, but I don't actually seek any right. I, don't, you know, I was trained in that, really, that we, as a press, should never ask for more rights than the members of the public. Mm -hmm. you know? So I don't, I don't think, I'm not ask, in favor of any special rights. Mm -hmm. I think all this should be open. And the problem at the moment is that one of the reasons there isn't openness offshore, for example, is that the, uh, the use of offshore tax havens and lack of transparency has become an integral part of, of, of international finance. So all the hedge funds and, and all the other financial instruments use as part of their an ordinary business, the same uh, methods and jurisdictions as the fraudsters and crooks. And they, they have to be separated out. And at the moment, there's a tremendous lobby against that because of the way that the, the, the financial system works. But in the back there, thank you, yourself, yeah. I'm afraid this will be maybe one more question, but that'll be it. Go ahead. So I recently did some investigative journalism for the BBC Regional Current Affairs Programme, and obviously you've got councillors in towns all across the country, everything's in newspapers, and it felt, in hindsight, compared to a lot of the stories that have broken globally, pretty, should we say, safe. And now I work at Sky, where we recently did a thing called The People Smuggler, and it was Alex Crawford chasing the guy behind North Africa people smuggler. And there was a bit where she was interviewing the top cop in Libya. And she sort of said, what, if you had this guy, what would you do? And she ba he basically said, I can't confirm who this guy is. I haven't got any resources. I don't necessarily trust the prosecutor. And it was an, an, as big a case of anarchy as you can imagine, really. I'm curious to know those two contrasting elements. So we say Britain brackets Europe versus anarchy. Which one is the most conducive to uh, getting your investigative journalism done and surviving as well, I suppose? <laughs> I, would, I would say something interesting I wanted to mention after Stephen's point about how the police are kind of a little bit behind, uh, definitely behind crime in the way that crime is transnational now and policing isn't. For example, when we did the Mafia story, uh, a Mafia in Africa, and, I've, and I'm working all the stories about Mafia, uh, and there are so many instances where people, uh, the laws, because the laws aren't the same in each country, nobody can ever get, if, if you're Italian Mafia and you disappear to Africa or the UK, you can't be extradited because they don't have that law, like Mafia Association. But in terms of things like data, like I spent nine months trying to get the tiniest piece of information from the National Crime Agency, nine months just to get them to confirm that they had seized assets of an organization which was uh, uh, owned by the, some, uh, one of the mafia families in, in uh, Italy. I called a colleague of mine. It took me like a month to get her to do it, but when she did it, within two hours she had 150,000 words of, from the prosecutor of documents of all the transcripts of wiretaps they just gave it all to her and it took me nine months to get the national crime agency to give me the tiniest and they wouldn't even give me the case 
number or the court that that it, that the assets were seized in. So there is an issue uh, in terms of um, e Europe and, and the UK. We're very secretive, and we don't like giving information out. And that's where was the other location then? Whether well, it was Italy, oh, right. but there was a bunch of other countries throughout Europe. But as Britain, we're not. We're really not. I mean, you can't even cops can't even talk to journalists anymore without. Hmm. But speaking about anarchy and security, a subject that you raised, just think of Yanukovych leaks, if you know the story, how the journalists actually got divers to go in that lake and get the documents from the bottom of the lake. And then they spent loads of amount of time drying them, scanning them and analyzing the corruption they found there. They've just won an, another award um, last week at the Global Investigative Journalism uh, Conference. I mean, uh, they're all alive and well and parting like hell last week. Um, so there's not a problem. At the other spectrum, there's a lot of very safely from behind your desk done investigations that we're doing and at GP just watch the energy desk. We're publishing quite a bit um, this week and the coming weeks. Th you can do that. You can do it from, from the comfort of your home in a very civilized, non-invasive and very safe physically way. So I, I don't think there's necessarily um, a problem between the two, but there are definitely certain environments that might want, you know, you might want to consider your safety, but we're not there, I think, I think none of us. One, other, one final point, perhaps, about that is that we tend to forget when we talk about these specific personal relationships with police that surveillance is a huge internalized and secretive function which makes it very difficult for the person you're dealing with to know who you are and what you represent and who that person is you're talking to and who they are and what they represent. And particularly if you realize that everything you've said, done electronically and digitally in the last seven and a half years mm -hmm. is being lodged in Utah right now. Every single bit of even detritus, electronic uh, pocket lint as they call it, all of that is being stored. So the ability of somebody to sustain themselves in a private way is almost ridiculous under the circumstances. Can we get the suites to rent that place? Quite right. Yeah. <laughs> just saying, I, mean, I just think that, that you know, we are there to do stuff where mm -hmm. others fail. You know, we're not prosecutors and we shouldn't be. Uh, and therefore, it's bound to be the case that you know, in countries where the, the system's completely broken down, that you're going to have better access because people are going to turn to you and hand you the documents. If they've got a, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a police force that will do the stuff, it's, it's, it's quite normal that you wouldn't expect to get the same um, sort of access. But do you want to live in that country that's uh, completely broken down? Hopefully, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but for I the story, yeah. Uh, just to finish on that and come back to that, uh, to that question on privacy, I think, I mean, I live in Eastern Europe and uh, people with money can get hold of this data anyway. So if you have money in Eastern Europe, you can order someone's phone to be tapped. Uh, you can order uh, a database uh, re regarding uh, customs, import, export. You can order bank accounts, uh, uh, transfers, and stuff like that. If you really have the money and you really want to do it. So I think the amount of data out there um, available to, like, what you say, uh, governments and also private people with money, it's uh, it's really huge it's already there um, I think yeah myself as a journalist I'm always in this uh, schizophrenic position where I, w I would like to see all these databases and uh, get all this kind of information and most of the time I, I, I do get it I do see it uh, but I totally understand the other uh, the other side uh, where if this data is kind of out there for everybody to see and connect and and put it together, well, it might end up uh, bad for some people. I think with that, we I'm afraid we're almost at the end. Can we have one more? Okay, go ahead. Um, just following on from that, I was recently talking to a retired senior fraud officer and talking about money laundering, um, and he was um, basically intimating that once it goes through the data trail and it goes through, let's say, through real estate or it's, the money has actually transacted, they go through a particular cost-benefit analysis saying there's no point in actually prosecuting or taking it any further. So I guess the question to yourselves is do you also go through a process of cost-benefit analysis as to what point do you spend time, effort and resource 
in trying to find the um, your end goal, if you like? You don't Myself? Have, you don't have um, money, um, right? I general, have no money to start <laughs> with, so that's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I can spend time. Uh, I can I can dig on to sort of parallel directions. On but I think most people years. would agree that there's a social interest. There's a public interest in large sums of money or large bits of political influence. And that's what we're after as journalists. And not small sums of how much you append a policeman in a small dark alley somewhere. But I think you, you have a point, And that's a big difference between what journalists doing this kind of cross-border collaborations do. And they, yeah. There is no cost-benefit uh, mm -hmm. analysis. So, I mean, you'd be prepared to spend 10 years or you know, X number of years. It's not like you, you work eight hours a day uh, searching through various databases the same name over and over again, although you can do that for a while. Um, you have uh, some usual suspects, you have some targets, people, entities, whatever, and you are focused on that, yes, and you are focused on that more than a year, maybe. There are projects that I've been doing with other journalists in Eastern Europe that took longer than a, a year or two or three. Well, sometimes you put it down and then pick it back up. Yeah. You know, yeah. so like you, you get to a certain point where it goes dry, something else comes up, you do that instead, and then you, that happens a lot. And then there's a grant. Mm -hmm. The journalism fund in Brussels, for example, um, I think sponsored both Craig and I on, on different investigations, and they do funds for cross-border reporting. But there are different funds. Some would fund you to get an editor as well. Some of them would fund you to get travel or a lawyer. But it depends. But there are ways of not going completely bankrupt and desperate. You're and on your own. When well, you take their money, eventually they want you to produce a story. So you exactly. But I think we're much less by by the fact we're, we're very small in what we do, and we don't have the resources, and we're much less methodical. And of course, and there is an implicit cost-benefit analysis where we just pick on some examples of things we can't investigate at all, just to shine some light and hope that people might take and make a broader investigation out of it. But with that, I want to thank everybody on the panel a lot. That was really terrific. Thanks so much. You can also that the, our members' club room downstairs on the first floor is open if you want to have a drink and carry